back in the day, it was considered to be sacrilegious to paint the word. Of course, when you run into an objection by your teacher, of course you want to go even further across the line, right? Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to furniture designer and maker, artist, and educator, Wendy Marayama. Wendy is a legend. Throughout her nearly 50-year career, Wendy has been extremely influential in the world of studio and artistic furniture. Internationally exhibited, her work is in the permanent collections of several museums, including the Victoria and Albert and LACMA, among others. And she's the recipient of several NEA grants, Fulbrights, and too many awards and accolades to mention. She's also a lifelong educator, and for 30 years was the head of furniture design at San Diego State, establishing it as one of the most prominent and respected furniture design programs in the United States. Third generation Japanese American, she was born with cerebral palsy and deaf in both ears. She discovered an interest in woodworking as a teenager, and by early adulthood, was one of the first two women to get an MFA in furniture design from Rochester Institute of Technology. I did my undergrad with Wendy at San Diego State, so she's a very important figure in my life. She's also a badass feminist and funny as hell. Let's hear from Wendy. My name is Wendy Mariapa, and I'm from San Diego, California. I am a, I guess, a woodworker and with a specific focus on furniture. I feel that uh, woodworking has a lot of potential for breaking outside of the mold of what furniture can be and go beyond sculpture. It's a hybrid. Well, we're going to talk all about your work, but before we get to Woodworker Wendy, we go all the way back to zero. I want you to take us to your childhood and tell us where did you grow up and what was your family dynamic and what were you like as a little kid? I was born in a small town called La Junta, Colorado, which is east of Pueblo. But my memory of living there is pretty blurry because we only lived there until I was about four or five. And then the family decided to move us to Hemet, California. My father started farming, so he raised uh, corn and cantaloupe and tomatoes and cucumbers, whatever was in season. So my memory of living in Hammett was pretty idyllic because we just lived in this old, old farmhouse kind of thing and we were surrounded by fields and you live an innocent life at that point. You don't really know about your shortcomings or your deficiencies when you're that young. So I think, you know, my memories of going to kindergarten all the way up to uh, third grade was very pleasant. I am told that it was a primarily white city. We were probably the only Asian people living in Hammett in San Jacinto. But, you know, when you're young, again, you, you don't think about those things. And it's too bad that we start to develop those distinctions that you get out of. Did you sense that your family was aware of being the only Asians? Did they feel other? They were sensitive to it because you have to remember that only, say, 10 years before that was 1942 when Pearl Harbor was um, then the Japanese American community had to vacate their homes in California. That affected my mother's side of the family. So I think she was probably more sensitive to those things than my father. 
because my father grew, grew up in a farming community in Colorado, and a lot of the people he was friends with there were other Japanese Americans and a lot of Mexican Americans and, of course, a few Caucasian farmers, too. So I don't think that he felt the discrimination as much or maybe he wasn't as sensitive to it. I will add that my father has a great sense of humor, and I think that humor is what got him through to the other people that he came across. The guys fell in love with him because he was such a funny guy. <laughs> so they eventually forgot that he was Japanese-American. Maybe we were lucky in that regard, but then I was young then, so I wasn't really aware. My parents never said, oh, you can't believe what happened to me in the store. You know, we were kind of protected from that. And how did you, with cerebral palsy and hearing impairments, how did your parents treat you? It doesn't seem like they treated you any differently than a regularly abled person? Well, you know, my mother was wonderful. I mean, she believed that there was everything she can do to make me better in terms of physical therapy and speech therapy. And I think my father had more of a difficult time with that. He was a little more concerned about appearances, and especially amongst other Japanese Americans, I think Asian Americans tend to be kind of more judgmental about their own kind, and as we got older, they had a drive for the kids to become doctors and lawyers and that kind of people. My parents probably didn't envision me someday becoming a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. And because of my disability, they didn't have high expectations, you know. It was just the way it was back in the 50s, you know, 50s and 60s. That you're kind of stuck with whatever you end up with. And I mean, even I didn't think I was going to amount to much. But you've been so singularly driven your whole life. I'm surprised to hear that. Well, I mean, for first of all, because of my disabilities, I was really, really shy to uh, certainly was not by any means an extrovert. I was a total introvert, and I barely spoke to people because I was afraid of what people would think when they heard me talk. As a kid, I think I was pretty quiet and just tried to stay in the background. But it wasn't horrible. I mean, I went to a school that was eventually in Chula Vista. We moved from Hammett to Chula Vista, which, which you know, is the suburb of San Diego. And it's a much more diverse community. So in addition to many um, other Asian people, there was also a significant number of hearing impaired people at school that I was going to because they had a special program for the deaf. And that is where I learned to lip read and hopefully improve my speech and that sort of thing. So I think what was nice about being at that school was the other kids who were quote-unquote normal didn't pick on us as much as another school I had gone to where I was the only deaf person in the whole school. Well, it must have been really nice to not be singled out and to also have some support well, the funny thing is maybe they were making fun of me, but I probably didn't hear them. <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> the, no, joke, you know, the joke's on man. them. <laughs> <laughs> There's some advantages 
You know, I did get into art at that point. I started taking art classes when I was in fourth grade, and I was pretty fucking good at it, you know. (laughs) And everybody really loved the dinosaurs that I made out of clay. And I really felt like, oh, my God, I'm the best student at this clay class. I wasn't so good at math and geometry and that kind of stuff. But I, was, I had one thing that I was good at. So is clay how you expressed yourself as a, as a teenager? Is that where you sort of started to find your personal identity? Grade school and, and junior high. Of course, we had to take homemaking then too. But I kind of had fun in the sewing classes. I feel bad that kids that age don't know how to sew anymore. Of course, we weren't allowed to take shop classes in grade school or high school. Just due to being female? No, we were not allowed to take shop. So I'm glad that it existed for my, during that time, in 1964 to the time that I graduated from high school. I hated high school. Okay, it was all about being popular, and I was not popular, of course. I wanted to be, but I was not popular, so I couldn't wait to get out of high school. Well, where did you go after high school? Southwestern College in Chula Vista. Oh, okay. Uh, Originally, my parents wanted me to take a typing class so that I could learn to be a secretary and make money that way. But I couldn't type 50 words a minute. And so that's when I decided to take a craft class at Southwestern. And that was my first experience with woodworking. Oh, my God. And you never looked back. (laughs) Yeah. So that was really the beginning of my, my life turning over a little bit. I always thought that woodworking was for men. I mean, that was the, the, you're conditioned to think that in the 50s and 60s, but I don't know what the big deal was because all you have to do is push a button and the machine comes on. I mean, what's the big deal? <laughs> so it was kind of challenging and it was fun to do something that I thought was taboo for a woman at that time. And then did you also start to find your passion for it? Mm Mm-hmm. It developed further when I... I mean, there was a lot to learn, as you know. Woodworking is kind of complicated, and there's a lot to know about safety and hand tools. So by the time I felt really comfortable with it, that was when I moved to Boston and went to Boston University for two years just to further my experience in woodworking. Yeah, and you studied with, who did you study with there? Alphonse Mattia. Alphonse, yes. But he's great. Alphonse was really wonderful to work with because he not only had the traditional background of furniture making, he was also on the fringe of exploiting what woodworking could do besides just beautiful furniture. I mean, he made beautiful furniture, but he was able to kind of expand on that back in the 70s. So you did two years at Boston University, and then you went to RIT? That's correct. When I was at BU, I also studied with Jerry Osgood. Yes. He was fantastic. I mean, Jerry is, as far as I'm concerned, he's he's a god. (laughs) And he's really uh, humble, but he really knows his stuff. It was a nice combination of young, upbeat, and mature Jerry Osgood. That sounds like a star-studded education right there. I can imagine you also started to really expand upon what you were able to do technically and creatively. And that pulled you to to RIT, where you 
studied, where you went to grad school, right? I realized that if I wanted to take my career to a certain level of, say, teaching or just really advancing my own portfolio of work, I needed to go to grad school. That was a good experience. It was a, it was a little more difficult there. So graduate school um, at RIT, you were one of the first two women to graduate from that program. That's right. I, I mean, you're really trailblazing here, Wendy. And at this point, <laughs> how has your family grown to accept that this is your destiny and that you are a, a burgeoning wood star? Well, you know, my father was very impatient with me because, you know, it was expensive for my parents to help me go to school, you know. They're just farmers and secretaries. So, I mean, I understand now, but at the time I, I was really frustrated because he, you know, I have two younger sisters and he clearly wanted to save enough money to send them to college, too. And so he was wondering why I was going to Boston University when I wasn't really getting a degree. I was just getting a sort of a post-bac experience there with no intention of getting a degree. They didn't have an MFA, and I didn't need a BFA because I already had one. He would call me, like, late at night, and say, when are you going to get out of there? I can't afford to pay for all of your work and, you know, your rent. And, you know, you got to get a job and, you know, this and that and this and that. And finally, I, that's when I decided to go to graduate school because I was told that if I got an MFA, I might have a better chance of having some sort of salary position in higher education. And to me, that was a little scary because I never envisioned myself to become a teacher. I thought maybe I would just go and be in a little shop by myself and make little cabinets. But my work was also starting to go beyond furniture and I needed room to explore that more extensively. Then when I told Dad that I was going to go to grad school, he hit the roof because, well, how many more years is that? And, you know, how much is that going to cost? So I just managed to, like, plod on despite those threatening phone calls <laughs> So how did you get started professionally? What were some of the early, big, exciting pieces, projects, exhibitions, breaks? Well, in grad school, I was probably the first person to start painting the wood, which, you know, really not a big deal now, but back in the day, it was considered to be sacrilegious to paint the wood. And, of course, when you get, when you run into an obstacle or an objection by your teacher, of course you want to go even further across the line, right? (laughs) I started painting or coloring the work that I made for my thesis, keeping that kind of brief how graduate school ended for me. When I um, left RIT, my first job was teaching at Appalachian Center for Crafts in Tennessee, and I had the freedom to make anything I wanted, pretty much. And that's when I made the Mickey Macintosh chairs. It's really funny because I really wanted to make this chair that emulated Charles Rennie Macintosh and Mickey Mouse because growing up in Southern California, the ears were so iconic 
and the high back chair that Macintosh designed was so iconic. And so I wanted to mesh those together. And it turns out to be my trademark piece. I mean, to this day, I'm still making those chairs. And they're in a lot of museum collections now. It's funny because I could barely get $500 a chair back in the day. But now they're selling for 14000 a piece. So, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you asked about any signature pieces, and that's probably the one that most people seem to remember. At what point, I have to ask this because, um, in case our listeners don't know, I studied with you at San Diego State and your furniture design program. That's where I did my undergrad. <laughs> and that program people traveled from far and wide to come and teach with you. It's a very important program and you touched a lot of people's lives and you made a lot of furniture makers came out of your program. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that fact. I mean, uh, it was fun for me because like you mentioned, everybody came from all over the country, even the world, to little old San Diego State. I even learned how to say the word Yipsilani. <laughs> <laughs> Yipsilani is where uh, Amy's from. <laughs> and so that just made life so interesting. And we also had some really great students when you were there. It was like a real close community of people. You know, it was just really an amazing time. And it's funny because each wave of students was a different community that have managed to stay intact in their own little groups. You know, there's one right after you. You graduated. You were with uh, Tanya Aguinaga. She was after me. But then when she came back to Los Angeles after grad school, she worked on my TV show. And that's how we met each other. Oh, you kidding? You know, I thought you met before from San Diego. And no, but of course we knew a lot of the same people and we had gone to the same places. And now she's my best friend in the whole world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's great, isn't she? So that's what really is rewarding to me that these communities have formed. And I think one of my primary goals is that the teacher was not only teaching people, but it was to nurture that very sense of community and making sure that people did things together, uh, party together. I mean, that was quite a, that was quite a party and group of people. Yeah, we, we partied very hard. That is true. <laughs> but we also worked very hard and it was incredibly collaborative and the mentorship was really off the charts. That's the culture that you created. The students were very interdependent and very supportive of each other. I felt like I learned a lot from you, but I learned so much from everyone else as from well. Else. So I really do think that's important because you've got 20 or 30 different minds working under the same roof, and they all have a different approach to a specific problem, and you need to have that. Yeah, well, you created something really, really special there. And uh, you did it for 30 years, right? 30 years, not including um, Tennessee and TTA. Okay. Which was my first job before I came to San Diego. Wow. And you yeah. retired five years ago. I was at your retirement party. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> well, funny because I lived the uh, my Current studio mate is now one of the faculty members at San Diego State. So I managed to sort of stay kind of on the post of what's going on in the program. Of course, you know, I have a hands-on approach at this point, but I always like to see where things are going to go. Like right now, 
it's kind of a scary time because I think a lot of programs are reassessing what can they do given the new protocols that are being established and forced upon them in terms of the academic year. I'm just glad I'm not yeah, doing it. You got out just in time. <laughs> but I've been sitting in on some of the discussions about that. Now, it's very fascinating. The challenges, I think, will come up with some positive elements that wouldn't have come up otherwise. I do think it's a very interesting time. We're having to rely on digital technology to reinforce a hands-on craft. And the hands-on is more important than ever because we're burnt out from all the digital technology. And so people are really needing and craving um, an ability to work with their hands, have a sensitivity to the material Mm -hmm. world, decarbonize the Mm -hmm. way things are are manufactured, build Mm -hmm. things that last longer and mean more. And all of that requires a very active physicality and a hands-on nature. But now Mm -hmm. we're having to use digital tools to teach that. So it's a really fascinating juxtaposition. I think um, the digital stuff is great. Here's the problem I have with digital work. It it has such an imprint on the work that's made, that it's really obvious that that was cut out with a CNC or it was laser cut. Uh, you know, I'd like to see people take that much further than what I've seen. You know, like, I get a little tired of the stack Baltic Birch, for example. <laughs> it was really cool at first. I don't mind that digital technology has replaced some other laborious traditional methods like bandsawing, a million parts that are identical. I think CNC is great for that, making multiple parts that are exactly the same size to build a larger piece. But at the end, I like it to look more handmade, perhaps, you know, So, Wendy, over the span of your career, you've done a lot of residencies, earned many, many awards, accolades, grants, generated a vast and meaningful body of work, been acquired by museums, exhibited internationally. Oh, my God, I'm so proud of you. (laughs) You're such a fucking badass. (laughs) Well, you know, now... Now, Dad is very proud <laughs> Good. of Good, he came around. And every, time, <laughs> every time Dad comes to one of my shows, the first thing he would look for is the price list. And then he'll want to see well, how much is this and how much is that. And finally, you know, he's gotten off my back, <laughs> you know. But, you know, that's not how I put value to my work. I'm not dead, but as far as assigning numbers to my work, that's something that I really don't care about, but maybe I should care more about it. It's a very complicated thing. You well, know? well what, how do you assign meaning to your work? What's significant? What holds the most significance for you over your career? Well, first of all, you mentioned residencies, and I I can't stress enough how important it is for artists to remove themselves from their familiar workspaces and work in a different culture, maybe, or a different country and culture, because I think it broadens your outlook on life in general. One of the most important things for me was to do the residency in Tokyo for six months. I lived there for six months without learning a word of Japanese, if you <laughs> believe that. Being Japanese-American, I felt like it was important for me to get back to my roots somehow and to understand where my grandparents came from as well as to appreciate the value of craft in Japan. I mean, Japan's um, 
craft history and culture, so you can't compare it with any of the other different craft cultures. It's uh, mm -hmm. so impeccable and so, so simple, so complicated. And so that was important for me to be in that kind of environment. And of course, the work that I made there was inspired by being there. Like, my color palette changed completely. The California color palette was like fluorescent red and blue and green and really bright colors and very aggressive shape. But when I came back from Japan, the work became more restrained. Maybe the shapes were subtler and gentler and the colors were muted. So I really love the effect that the residency has on my work. Then another residency that was important was when I went to New York for six months for a residency, I decided to use that time to do research about the Japanese-American incarceration camps. I knew so little about it before then. And I felt like that was an oversight on my part to not even be able to name the 10 major incarceration camps. So the body of work that came out of there was more kind of an homage to, to my family and their community and the difficulty that they suffered from being displaced and simply because of the way how they just managed to come back and forge a new life for themselves after such a uh, horrible experience. So I really needed to kind of feel that through the work and maybe create an homage to those people, 120,000 people who had to go to camp. So that was meaningful to me. And before that, I didn't know very many Japanese Americans other than my family. And so this project put me together with a lot of um, Japanese American communities like the Buddhist temple, uh, various churches and organizations that put together. Are you talking about the TAG project? Can you tell our listeners about that, what that is? I'm happy to. If any of you have seen pictures taken in 1942 of all these families that were taken away to the camp, they all had these identifying tags that had their names and their locations and serial number that was assigned to them. That was almost symbolic to them, not much different than uh, the gold star that was assigned to the Jews in Nazi Germany. Each person did have a number, and then I had no idea how many people were taken away from their home, 120,000 people. So I felt like, you know, I wanted to recreate the tag for each individual person that was taken away. I felt that that would be, a vis you know, give the viewer some visualization about how many people were affected. Creating the 10 large groupings of tags was kind of a daunting project. But a lot of people found out about it, and they wanted to volunteer. And so we had big tag parties at the different organizations, including the Renwick Gallery in Washington, D.C., a couple of local galleries in San Diego, the Buddhist Temple here, um, the Japanese American Historical Society here and in Santa Barbara, and I was also sending out shoeboxes full of tags, and I made a kit that had a number and stamp, 
and a database which was usually 10 page sheets of names. Each person would fill it out with their family or a friend and then send it back to me. And it took about four years to accumulate all the tags to assemble into these camps. But for me, it became a social event. And just to get to know all these people that knew my grandparents and my parents when they were younger, it was like a little bit of a storytelling event. It's kind of like quilting beads where people would sit around and stitch a quilt, except in this case, they were writing tags. A lot of former and culturally participated, and oh, it was wow. oh, I know this guy. He, you know, we went fishing together. Oh, this is my great grandmother. You know, it was really kind of nice to, to kind of bring the personal stories out with the name. What an incredible, active way to honor that experience. I wish that my grandparents yeah. were still alive to see all that. It was really cathartic for me to be able to do that. I don't know that I would do it again, but I'm glad I did it once. It's kind of like when I hand planed a four-foot <laughs> wide piece of bubinga because it wouldn't fit in the planer. Jerry didn't want me to cut it in half and run it through the planer in two pieces. So I had to hand plane it. Well, it's good to do it once, (laughs) but I don't think I would do it again. And that's the way I feel about the tag project. I'm glad I did it once, but I'm not so sure I'd do it again. You're always sort of pushing boundaries. You're very much a woodworker and you can hold your own with the craftiest, most technically astounding woodworkers, but you've never stayed static. A lot of your recent work includes video. Uh, You've always kind of pushed boundaries and incorporated a modern concept into your work. I wonder if you can talk about the creative process and the concept behind the work that includes video. In the the most recent work, The videos, to me, was a way of archiving the memory of the subject matter that's in that video. And in this case, the wildlife project was about the problems of poaching wild animals for financial gain. And this is not controlled we're no longer going to have those magnificent animals roaming the earth. So, in a way, it's maybe kind of a cynical approach to the project. I figured that the video of the rhinoceros would be the only remnant or memory left of that animal if the poaching continued. Well, you've done a bunch of videos, right? You've done the Vanities and the Wildlife Project and even just the idea of including video built into your your carcass work is pretty intense mix of materials. Well, you know, the visual aspect of video, I think, triggers a different response to how you look at the work. There's kind of an air of familiarity, but at the same time, it, seems that the activity that you see on the screen is placed from the context. Well, for example, the vanities were about pretty much vanity, I guess, when women are pumping themselves in front of the mirror. We change the perception of ourselves, maybe. But in this case, there was an Asian woman that was putting on makeup and she was exaggerating her Asian features in the video. And it was sort of relating to how I think people are perceiving me as an Asian person or 
what people expect from Asian women, the stereotype of the big island exotic Asian geisha girl, the evil dragon lady. I just was kind of addressing identity. How does your creative process start? Do you tend to build everything in your head before you get going, or do you kind of work through it and let it unfold really intuitively? Or no, it's kind of hard. I mean, like right now, I I don't have any ideas in my head right now, but I think the work that I have been doing in the last 10 years have had some social message attached to it. Um, And I don't really consider myself an activist of any type, but I do get upset about certain things that happen in this world. But I think in a way it's therapeutic to address the things that trouble you through your work. Um, The most recent work is actually about dementia and Alzheimer's because I have a very close aunt that didn't have any kids. She was kind of like a second mom and her dementia became pretty bad last year and we finally had to make the difficult decision to put her into assisted living just at the beginning of the year. I've been thinking a lot about mirrors. I think mirrors are amazing things, I think. And I think that's why I used the mirror in the vanity. You know, if you remember, the vanity video was behind a two-way mirror. So when you saw the video, the mirror would disappear. And then when the video stopped, it became a mirror. In Japan, in the old days, an older woman, usually an older geisha, would use a black lacquered mirror because supposedly the black lacquer diminishes your wrinkles. And so you look more beautiful in black lacquer. And frankly, <laughs> I wish I had a black lacquered mirror too, but I digress. So I made a mirror, a mirror frame for my aunt. It was not for her, but for a show about Alzheimer's. And so the mirror is perfectly flat black all the way across, except at the very end, it begins to rip up. So it's almost like you're looking at water that's moving, kind of. So your reflection becomes distorted. I sort of envision the mirror as being representative of memory or the lack of or the disappearance of memory. So that's, that's the most recent piece that I just completed before the pandemic. But, you know, I don't know how that came to me, but I think it's, it's life in general that, triggers these ideas. You asked about how I came up with these projects, and I think it's like opening a magazine and reading about how terrible the elephant poaching problem is. And so somehow that I decided to make something that's about that problem. I mean, you mentioned the pandemic, and um, this has been... A crazy year, 2020, so far. <laughs> no shit. Oh God, How no are you shit. doing with, with all of this? I mean, <laughs> I've known you a while and I've never imagined you being daunted or slowed down. But like, I know you had a, a death in your family recently and this is a hard ass year. How are you reckoning with all of this uncertainty and turbulence? Well, in the beginning, I didn't feel like there was a whole lot of change in my routine because what I was doing was 
just being at home and then going to the studio to work. And I've been very lucky that, you know, our studio only has two people working in it. So Adam and I just simply work at different times and we use PPE when we're in the same room together. But we're both very careful about it. And so we've been able to work like normal. But that was back in, you know, March and April. And then all of a sudden it's May and it's July. And as, as I was telling you earlier, I'm missing that communication with other people in real time. I've only started using Zoom in the last month. Because of my hearing impairment, it's very difficult for me to use telephones. And Zoom is not really the perfect solution, but I've realized that I need to do it more because I'm suffering from this isolation and not being able to talk as much as I'm used to. And I'm not a big talker, but I like listening to people and, you know, talking and I miss going out to dinner and lunch. I'm sure a lot of people are missing that aspect of life. But it's hard. Uh, but at, on the other hand, um, I did make a few pieces that I um, probably would not have made because of the pandemic. It's just weird, you know, just a weird piece with branches and gold leaves. You know, cool. and brushes, I learned how to make a brush. I just finished taking an online class at Anderson Ranch with Adrian Tagar, but we learned what was called photogrammetry, which is a process of scanning with the iPhone, getting 3D images and using that to cut workout on the CNC or the laser cutter or the uh, 3D printer, and that was all, uh, you know, virtual, and it was all digital work, and I probably wouldn't have done that under normal circumstances, but... I am happy to hear that you haven't slowed down learning new technology and making your work. Do you ever just, like, look back over the course of your life, sort of in the way that you grappled with the enormity of the internment camps and there were 120,000 people whose lives were affected. Now, in a much more positive way, you've affected a large volume of people's lives too, through your furniture program, but also through the work that you make and how many exhibits and residencies you've done, how your work has been viewed and used and acquired by so many people. They have long-term relationships with it. You've fostered and nurtured so many communities and, you know, other makers and creatives. Do you ever look back at that and just kind of feel like, damn, I did something real here? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's it's kind of, I sort of think of everybody as my extended family. Growing up, meaning in the 20s and 30s, I never really had a desire to marry and have children Having kids was never something that I really wanted to do. And so, consequently, marriage didn't seem to be necessary until I was 55. I got married when I was 55. (laughs) I recommend that to most people, to wait that long. But I feel happy that I have all these students that have become sort of like my extended family, and I'm very lucky that I see a lot of them on a regular basis, even though they're spread out all over the country. I always try to make an effort to visit them if I happen to be in a state where they are, and I always have a great time every time I see them, and it's always amazing to see their progress and their shop and to meet their students and to visit their schools. I feel fortunate that 
my life is so rich with these people. I mean, I'm not rich financially, but I feel very wealthy in terms of the kinds of connections I've had with people like yourself and observing how people have navigated their own um, path. There's no two alike. Well, I personally thank you. You've impacted my life in a really meaningful way, and uh, I'm grateful. I'm super grateful. You did too. Oh, my God. When you wanted to make <laughs> uh, a poetry out of Steve <laughs> you made that incredible piece, and I was like, no, you can't <laughs> Well, do that. you said so yourself when you experience, you know, some resistance from your authority figures, you fight even harder in that direction. <laughs> I love it. When you think about things that you want to do next, that you want to tackle and take on, what comes to mind? Well, I kind of miss traveling. You know, I want to get out of here. I want, I want to I go somewhere new, maybe. I don't know what I want to make yet, but right now I'm just thinking fresh. I don't think too far into the future like some people do, but maybe I continue the digital work that I just learned last week. Or maybe I just reorganize my studio. <laughs> or maybe, I don't know, go on a diet. I don't know. But right now, like you said, the pandemic has really screwed things up, and so it's really hard to think about the future right now. I do want to add that I've joined a couple of nonprofits this year, and so I'll be on the advisory board for Craft in America, which is in Los Angeles. And I have also joined the Craft Emergency Relief Foundation. So I will be busy with uh, the nonprofit work. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, Wendy, you are a true powerhouse, and it has been really fun for me to visit with you like this and also get to ask you all of these personal questions that I never had the guts to ask you when I was your student. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What kind of personal question? Oh, you know about growing up being the only Asian American in a farming community. and <laughs> You know, to be honest, I'm only reminded that I'm deaf or Asian when someone else mentions it, you know. I don't even think about it. I sometimes forget. Well, you know, I forget it too because I think of you... Your primary characteristics to me are your fierce, fierce sense of humor and incisive wit and talent and character. And I think of your work. I think of Mickey McIntosh. And then somewhere in there, I remember that you're... I always think that you're female. I never forget that you're a woman. And and a a very powerful role model for me. So, I mean, thank you. That's true. I think that being a female in the field is probably the most salient identity that I'm most aware of on a daily basis. And I think that's important. I think uh, I certainly don't reject that notion at all. One of my earliest uh, mentors was actually another very well-known female artist, and her name is Arlene Fish. I don't know if you ever took any classes with her. She taught jewelry design at San Diego State. Well, she was my teacher when I was in undergrad school, and she was going all over the world, and she was, you know, was making work and teaching, and I remember thinking, I want to be like that. I didn't know that women could do that, and she was doing that. She was doing residencies in Scandinavia. She was in a lot of solo shows in New York City. She was just really her own person. And that's when I kind of, you know, I want to be like that. So I think it's important to have a mentor at any point. You know, I'd love to have a new mentor 
even at the age of 57, it'd be fun to have enough, you know, a mentor. I don't mind being a mentor to others. I'm happy if, if I can encourage people to pursue whatever they want. The way I look at it is, if I can do it, you can do it. I mean, you know, I'm deaf and all this stuff, and I could do it. Being an able pers- able-bodied person, <laughs> you should certainly do it, you know. Well, Wendy, it has been such a joy to talk to you about your life and your work, and you're such a powerhouse. The only thing that's missing <laughs> is a couple of martinis so we can both be yes. drinking, you know. I can't wait until we can do that next time. Yes, next time. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so happy we got to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. To see images of Wendy's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app, or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. It totally helps. We love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.